The Radio Planet by Ralph Milne Farley. Chapter 9 A Prisoner. The squad of Ver King soldiers, with Miles Cabot as their prisoner, had traveled nowhere near the distance to the palace when they turned from the street through a gate. Where are they going to take me now? Miles wondered. This question was soon answered, for the party entered a building which was evidently a dwelling of the better class. The hall was well lighted, and so Miles blinked at the sudden glare. The leader of the party placed himself squarely in front of his prisoner with his hands on his hips and remarked with apparent irrelevance, Well, we fooled Quiven, didn't we? The prisoner stared at him in surprise. It was Judd, Judd disguised as a common soldier. Cabot laughed with relief. You certainly gave me a bad hundred and forty-fourth part of the day, he asserted. I didn't recognize you in your street clothes. What is the great idea? The great idea, the noble replied, to quote your phrase, is that I did truly represent the off the grim. He authorized me to arrest you in his name. The pretty little spy will report your capture to Arkilu, and her father will stonedly refuse to reveal where you are imprisoned. Meanwhile, I shall give the Golden One time to escape, and shall then send a second squad's squad to seize your effects. Your expedition will start immediately. Come, unbind my prisoner. As soon as his bonds were loosed, Miles warmly grasped the hand of his benefactor. You are all right, he exclaimed. You have completely succeeded without leaving anything to explain. I always succeed, and never have to explain anything. Judd replied a bit coldly, and so late that night the radio man, dressed in leather tunic and helmet, and armed with a tempered wood rapier, set out with his bodyguard for the western mountains. In silence and with a minimum of light, they threaded the streets of Judd's compound and then the streets of the city until they came to the west gate, where they passed by the off the grim and gave, where a pass signed by the off the grim, gave them free exit. Thence they moved due westward across the plain, with scouts thrown out to guard against any contact with roving roes. By daybreak, they had reached the cover of the wooded foothills, and there they camped for the full day of much-needed rest. Finally, on the second morning, following their stealthy departure from Verkingi, the journey really started. The commander of the bodyguard was an intelligent youth named Crota. During the meals at the first encampment, Miles described to Crota in considerable detail the particular form of copper pyrites, which furnished the bulk of the copper used for electrical purposes on the continent of Cubia. After listening intently to this description for about the fifth time, Crota smiled and said, We ver kingies place no stock in pretty stones except as playthings for our children, but I do recall the little golden cubes with which the children of one of the hill villages are accustomed to play tum-tum. This village, sir, by the name, is only a day's journey southward. Let us turn our steps thither and learn from the children where they get the such toys. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, the earthman quoted to himself, and so they set out southward, following a trail, which wound in and out between the fertile silver-green hills, which were, for the most part, scantily wooded. Toward the close of the day, Crota's scouts established contact with the outposts of the village, which they were seeking, and after an exchange of communications by runner, the expedition was given free pa passage to proceed. Shortly thereafter, they came in sight of the village itself. From around the surrounding verdant rolling terrain, there rose one rocky eminence, with per precipitous sides and a flat summit on which stood the village of Sir, surrounded by a strong wooden palisade. Up the face of the cliff, there ran a narrow zigzag path cut in living rock and overhung hung by many a bastion, from which huge stones could be tumbled or molten pitch poured as the invaders so rash as to attempt ascent. Along this path, the expedition crawled in single file with many pauses to draw their breath, and before they reached the summit, Cabot realized, well, how it was that Sir, the southernmost outpost of the Varakingan civilization, had so long and so successfully withstood the onslaughts of the wild and savage Rowleys. The inhabitants, furry Verkings, turned out in large number to greet the visitors and especially to inspect the fertilest body and the much overfurred chin of the Earthman. Guides led the expedition to a large public hall, where after a speech of welcome by the headmen of the village, they were led and quartered for the night. Between meal and bedtime, the visiting soldiers strolled out to see the sights by the pale pink light of the unset, unseen setting sun.
Kabat and Crona together walked to the west wall to observe the sunset. As the two of them leaned on a parapet, a rattling noise on the rocky walk beside them disturbed their reverie. Looking down, they saw three furry ch children rolling some small objects along the ground. With a slight exclamation of surprise and pleasure, the Ver King soldier swooped down upon the youngsters, scooped up one of the toys, and handed it to the Earthman. Tum Tum! Crota laconically announced. And sure enough, it was one of the small game cubes with which he had described to his companion. But before the latter had the slightest opportunity to examine it, the despoiled infant let out a howl of childish rage and commenced to assail Miles with fists and teeth and feet. Stop that! Crota shouted, grabbing him by one arm and pulling him away. We don't want to keep your tum tum. We merely want to look at it. This gentleman has never seen a tum tum. Gentlemen, the boy replied from a safe distance, common soldier more. Bah! But Miles Kabat was too engrossed to notice the insult. The small cube in his hand was undoubtedly of metallic crystal, but whether chalicorporite or not, he could not tell in the fading light. In fact, it might be the sunset which gave the stone its coppery tinge. Taking a small flint knife from a leather sheath that hung from his belt, Miles offered it to the child in exchange for the toy. In spite of Crota's gasping protest at the extravagance, the boy eagerly accepted the offer, remarking, Thank you, sir. You should take off those horrible clothes. It was a very neat and subtle compliment. Gentlemen, very kings never wore clothes. Kabat was impressed. Your name, my son? he asked, patting the furry little creature on the top of the head. Tomo the Brief was the reply. I shall remember it. Then he hurried back to the public hall, eager to examine his purchase by light of oil flares. Sure enough, it turned out to be really pyrites, and by the deep color, probably a pyrite rich in copper. To the radio man, it appeared the first tangible step toward the accomplishment of the greatest radio feat ever undertaken on two worlds, namely, the construction of a complete sending and receiving set out of nothing but basic materials in their natural state without aid of a single previously fabricated man-made tool, utensil, or chemical. To this day, Miles wears this cube as a pendant charm in commemoration of that momentous occasion. As he lay on the floor in the public building that night, the Earthman reviewed the events of the day until he came to the episode of the purchase of the cubical pyrite crystal from the little Tomo. Your name, my son, Kabat had asked him. My son, thought Kabat, I have a son of my own. Across the boiling seas to the continent of Cupia and a wife, the most beautiful and sweetest lady in Poros. They are in dire danger. Or were so many months ago when I received the SOS, which led me to return through this planet. Oh, how I wish I could learn what that danger was and what happened to them since then. Thus he mused. And yet, when he came to figure up the time since his capture, he was able to account less than three weeks of Earth time. Perhaps there was still a chance of rescue, if he could but hurry. <laughs> The danger which had inspired this Lilith's call for help was undoubtedly due to the return of Prince Yuri across boiling seas. For all miles, new Princess Lilla and the loyal Cupians were still holding out against the renegade prince. The message which Kabat had ticked out onto the ether, ether through the radio station of the ants had sent nearly only a few days after the SOS. If received by Lilla or any of her friends, it had undoubtedly served to encourage them to defend their <laughs> resistance to the usurper, and if received by Yuri, it had undoubtedly thrown him into the fear of the great builder. Musing and hoping thus, the Earthman fell into a troubled sleep, through which there was swirled a tangled phantasmagoria of ant-men, cupians, whistling bees, and bear kings, with occasional glimpses of little blue-eyed blonde head, sometimes surrounded by surmounted by golden curls and two dainty antennae, but sometimes completely covered in golden fur. Shortly after sunrise, he awoke and aroused Crota. No time must be lost. The princess Lilla must be saved. But there was nothing they could do until their host brought food for the morning meal. From the bearers, they now ascertained that the tum tum cubes were gathered in a cleft in the rocks only a short distance from the village. And that, although the perfect cubes were rare and quite highly prized, the imperfect specimens were present in great quantities. In fact, hundreds of cartloads had been mined and picked over in search of perfect cubes, and thus all this ore would be available in return for mere trouble of shoveling in two carts. As soon as the arrangements could be made with the headman of Sir, Kabat and his party, accompanied by guides, crept down through the narrow zigzag path to the plain below the village and proceeded up into a ravine into a quarry, where they verified all that had been told them.
It was beautiful a sight, a rocky wall out of a cleft in which seemed to pour a waterfall of gold. But on close inspection, every cube was seen to be nicked or bent or out of proportion, or jammed part way through or into another cube. The soldiers, both those from Fair Kingy and those from Sir, scrambled up the golden cascade and started hacking the crystals out of the solid formation in search for perfect cubes, while their two leaders watched them with amusement from below. All at once there came a shriek, and one of the Ver Kings toppled the whole length of the pile almost at Kabat's feet, where he lay perfectly still, the wooden shaft of an arrow projecting from his eyeball. Roy's Crota shouted. Instantly every member of the party took cover in the military procession behind some rock or tree. They had not long to wait, for a shower of missiles from the valley soon apprised them of the location of the enemy. So the Ver Kings thereafter remained alert. Those who had bows drew them and discharged a flint-tipped arrow at every stir of grass or bush in the locality whence the missiles of the enemy had come. We know not their number, Crota whispered to Kabat, and since we have accomplished our mission, let us return to Sir as speedily as possible. Agreed, the earth man replied. The withdrawal was accomplished as follows. Crota first dispatched runners to the village to inform the inhabitants of the situation, then leaving a small rear guard of archers and slingers to cover their retreat he formed the remainder of the expedition into open order and then set out for sir as rapidly as cover would permit the enemy kept pretty well hidden but it was evident from the increase of arrows and pebbles that their numbers were steadily augmenting noting this crota sent another runner ahead with this information it now became necessary to replenish and relieve the rear guard of which several were dead several more wounded and the rest tied and out tired and out of ammunition this done crota ordered the main body of his force to leave cover and take up the double quick the result was unexpected a hundred or more roys charged yelling down the ravine through the verkingi rear guard and straight at kabat's men who at once ran to cover again and took deadly toll of the en oncoming enemy but the Roy so greatly outnumbered the Ver Kings, the tide could not be stemmed, and soon the two groups were mingled together in a seething mass. The first rush was met, spear on spear, then the sharp wooden swords were drawn, and Kabat found himself lunging and parrying against three naked furry warriors. The neck was the vulnerable spot on the Ver Kings, and it was this point which the Roys strove to reach, as Kabat soon noted. That simplified matters regarding this one neck against such crude swordsmen as these furry aborigines was easy for a skilled fencer such as he. Accordingly, one by one, he ran three antagonists through the body. Just as he was withdrawing his blade from his last victim, he noted that Crota was being hard-pressed by a burly Roy swordsman. So he hastened to his friend's assistance, and he was just in time, for even as Kabat approached, the naked Roy knocked in the leather-clad Verking's weapon from his hand with a particularly dis dexterous sideswipe, and thus a Crota at his mercy. But before the naked one could follow up his advantage, the earthman hurled his own sword like a spear, and down went the Roy, impaled through the back, carrying Crota with him as he fell. Kabat paused to draw Beth breath and was just viewing with satisfaction the lucky results of his chance throw when a peremptory command of yield behind him caused him to wheel about and confront a new enemy the author of the shout was a massive furry warrior with a placid almost bovine face which nevertheless bes betokened considerable intellect and to whom should i yield if i did yield miles asked facing unarmed the poised sword of a new enemy grod this silent king of the roys was the dignified reply I thought that At the Terrible was king of your people. The Earthman returned, sparring for time. That was what At thinks, too, the other answered with a slight smile. But the smile was short lived for Miles Kabat. Kabat, having momentarily distracted his opponent's attention by this conversation, stepped suddenly under the guard of the furry Grod and then planted his fist square on Grod's fat shin. Down crushed the crashed this king, the sword clattering from his nerveless hand. In an instant, Miles snatched up the blade and bestrode his prostrate foe. Just as he was about to plunge its point into Grod's vitals, there occurred to him the proverb of Pobleth, while enemies dispute, the realm is at peace. With Grod the Silent and At the Terrible both contending for leadership of the Roys, Varkinga might enjoy a respite from the de deprecations of this wild and lawless race. He would leave the fallen Roy for dead, rather than put him actually in that condition. Accordingly, he sprang to the aid of companions. Crota was already back in the fray, his so own sword in his hand once more, and the sword of his late burly opponent slung it aside. Quite evidently, he did not intend to be disarmed again.
three very keen common soldiers, and Crota, and Miles now confronted seven Roys. This consisted of a fairly even match, for the superior intelligence and leather armor of the men of Very King and Sir offset the greater numbers of their aboriginal antagonists. What the outcome would have been can never be known, for at that moment the reinforcements from the village came charging up the ravine, and at the same instant the tops of the cliffs were lined with Roys, who sent down a shower of arrows upon those below. The contending twelve immediately separated. Kabod and his followers passed within the protection of his rescuers, and the return to Sir was renewed. The commander of the rescue party threw out a strong rear guard, and the fair king archers on both flanks peppered the cliff tops with slingshots and arrows, but the marauding Roys harassed every step of the retreat. There was some respite when Kabod's party reached the plain, where stood the rocky peak with the village of Sir on the summit, for arrows could not carry from the cover of the surrounding woods to the foot of the rocks. But as the tired party began the ascent of the narrow path up the face of the cliff, they noted that the Roys were forming solid banks of wooden shields and were advancing across the plain. Arrows now began to fly at them from below the ascending Bear King party, several of whom toppled and fell down the face of the cliff. And then the warrior just above Miles on the narrow path clutched his breast with a gasp and dropped square upon the earthman who braced himself and caught the body, thus preventing it from being dashed to pieces at the foot of the rocks. Whether or not the furry soldier was dead could not be ascertained until Miles should have reached the summit, so he toiled with his burden until he gained the protection of the palisade, where he and the Ver King he laid the Ver King gently on the ground and tore open the leather tunic to see if any life were present. The wounded man still breathed, the hoarsely, and his heart still beat, but there was a gaping hole in the side of his chest. No arrow protruding from the hole. Miles tenden tenderly turned the man over to see if the wound extended clear through. It did, almost, and from the man's side there projected the tip of a bullet, the still sheath tip of a leaden rifle bullet.